Welcome to Sports and a Slice of Life. And now, here's your host, Dave Lewis. Getting to do this show, I love covering sports, love covering entertainment, and today getting a chance to do both with Brian Morris, the Wonder Boy, independent professional wrestler out of New Jersey. How's it going, young man? It's going great, Dave. How are you? Awesome. I've been uh, you know, caught off guard by my social media feed, watching you, you know, do what you do. And just a little background, I met you three or four years ago out in Stockton. Yeah. With basketball, you were the color commentator, had a chance to work with you. And I thought, yeah, nice kid. He's, you know, bright, smart, well-dressed, classy. He's going to be an accountant if he's not a play-by-play announcer, although he's a damn good play-by-play announcer, a sports commentator. And now you're wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, for, I guess for people who don't who didn't really know me that well, it's it's kind of a shock considering um my uh supposed career path through college. Yeah. Here's your mom. I had a chance to talk with her about half an hour ago about your start, your interest in wrestling. When he was about 8, uh he started he had those action figures and he started creating stop motion films with a little digital camera I had bought him. And so he would be down in our basement and use fishing line and he had a little ring and, and he would create matches frame by frame uh, of these guys. And he always seemed to understand the performance value of it, even from that early age. And to me, that was very comforting because, of course, I think any mother, and I've spoken to some of his his colleagues, uh, some of the other performers' mothers, and we all have the same fear, you know, that they're going to break their neck someday. But he seemed to understand the performance value of it. And, and Dave, you know, you didn't see this in him, but he was a, he was a little performer when he was young. That's right. When you were a kid, you were a, more than just a guy behind the mic, but you wanted to be in front of the camera too, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I was always a big part of it, and and um, I I'm glad that she said that because uh, her <laughs> it, it doesn't seem like she um she worries too much about me, which is which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, when I was when I was a kid, I was a huge fan of of pro wrestling and especially the performance side, and I did you know understand that aspect of of the business and and you know with parlayed with the athleticism, you know, makes for a pretty, pretty great show. So it was always, it always caught my eye. It was always super entertaining to me, but yeah, that's a good memory making the stop motion videos in the basement. That's yeah. That was a fun time. Do you recall a lot of that stuff with the video? Yeah, I do. Um, I would, I'd come home from school with like a few of my friends and like my cousins and, and we'd go, uh, we'd go film that stuff and we'd go set it up and we'd have all these ideas and then we'd, we'd try to execute it. I think some of them came up pretty good i was gonna like start a youtube channel with all these matches on it um that was like a big thing back then on on youtube the stop motion wrestling uh with the with the action figures but yeah that was that was a good time i, I almost completely forgot about that until until just now do those exist at all in any form that you could still see uh, oh probably they're probably somewhere they're on a uh, sd card somewhere i i gotta dig those up yeah yeah that'd be great to save you know for your legacy, your kids, your grandkids to see what you did when you were little. Mm. That's a good Who idea. were your uh, wrestling heroes growing up? Wow. Um, when I first got into it, it was like 2007. And so that was like the height of John Cena. He was, I mean, he was everything um, to, to a lot of kids, but specifically to me, like, the small group of friends I had at school that, that knew about wrestling and that watched wrestling, John Cena was the guy, um, <clears throat> him and, and the other big guys like the undertaker was, was uh, on top then, um, Batista was on top then. And it's so funny. Cause like John Cena and, um, Batista, like the two guys that I really liked, they're in like every movie ever now, which is so funny to see like how they've transitioned into the other side of the entertainment industry. But, um, yeah, those two guys were, were big when I was growing up in your dream world. Would you, Hey, blow up as a wrestler and then you know, make that crossover to like John Cena, the rock, et cetera. Um, if the opportunity presents itself, like it, it's, it's funny that you said that. Cause that's, that's kind of reserved for like the most successful 
guys to ever, you know, come out of the pro wrestling industry. Um, so if, if I'm ever in that position, if I've ever had the privilege to be in that position, um, yeah, I, I, I guess so. I'd, I'd have to take it. I'd have to explore that for sure. Yeah. That would mean you're pretty damn good as a wrestler to get to that. <laughs> right. Work. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Hey, so, uh, she told me that the pandemic actually helped you in terms of getting, you know, on this path. Explain. Yeah. Um, so, well, basically like September of 2019 before, you know, anybody was even thinking about the COVID-19 or, and all the things that went along with that. Um, I was a senior in college at, at Elon university and I'd always wanted to try pro wrestling. Um, so one day I just kind of looked up, you know, there pro wrestling schools in the area of, of, uh, Burlington, North Carolina. And there happened to be one 10 minutes from my apartment door. Um, so I emailed the guy, the, the, uh, co-owner and the head coach, Jeff Rudd. I really hope he listens to this. Um, and he's a great dude and, and headed or went over there and started training. Um, and it's so funny cause you know, as you know, Dave, I was, uh, my senior year and I was broadcasting Elon basketball games, um, as you mentioned earlier. And as soon as I started training, you know, I was picking it up quick, all the physical stuff, but um, he was smartened up to the fact that I was doing the broadcasting. So he made me like the voice of their show for a few months. Um, so I was doing play by play commentary, professional wrestling, um, on, uh, weekends at the time, like almost, I think like two Saturdays a month. And then I was training during the week and then I was doing the basketball broadcast as well. Um, so that was, it was just a crazy time. And that was, you know, before 2020. And then, you know, unfortunately for, for that, uh, school, um, in November of 2020, um, it went under and they stopped doing shows and it completely, you know, stopped running and, and, uh, it was kind of a shock to everybody involved. But after that, I, I had kind of picked up training a little bit at another place in North Carolina in, in January. Um, but with the basketball schedule, it just wasn't possible to, to continue to do both. And so then after basketball ended, we were in uh, Washington, D.C. for the CAA tournament. And on the way back from the tournament, everything shut down. So there was going to be no more wrestling training, nothing, you know. Um, and uh, from then until I moved back to Jersey, um, back home where I grew up, um, there was no there wasn't even a thought of continuing to do that. You know, I think everybody was trying to figure uh, their lives and their careers out at that point. Um, and so in August, 2020, um, I uh, saw that the monster factory in South Jersey um, was reopening and they were taking uh, new students. So I signed up there and uh, in August and I've, I've been there ever since, but um that whole time really, you know, made me think about and, and really made me reevaluate, you know, what I wanted to do and the career path that I wanted to pursue. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that was a, it was a crazy time for everybody, but, um, that time in particular, the summer of 2020 really, you know, I, I had, I really got my mind set on, on what I wanted to do and, and how much effort I wanted to put into this. So, um, yeah, after that, it was, it was full steam ahead and I've been there ever since. Earlier in your college career, were you thinking more of the quote real world? Hey, I'm going to be uh, doing minor league baseball in Greensboro, or I'm going to be an accountant or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, particularly the minor league one. <laughs> I, I was definitely, you know, on that career path and uh, to doing um, play by play or to doing some sort of sports broadcasting. Um, and I was so lucky to work under people who taught me so much about the industry and, and great broadcasters themselves. And I was able to, you know, get invited to the national sports media awards and make so many connections. And, you know, unfortunately just towards the end of it, towards my, the end of my senior year, um, I, I just realized that maybe, uh, you know, I, I didn't love it as much as I once did. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it was so it was such a funny story because like i was already on such a a distinct path in that career i had i had connections set up i could have jobs set up like right as i got out of school um and uh and i you know i just kind of as i said reevaluated everything and and discovered this new thing that i'd always wanted to try and i knew that if i didn't 
try it senior year of college, if I didn't try it in September of 2019, I probably would never try it. So I'm really glad that I did at the time that I did too. Imagine being you know, 35, you know, sitting in a rocking chair, kind of wondering what if, right? Exactly. That'd be something to be tough to live with. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think I sent this great, this great email to the guy, Jeff, who ran that school. Um, I, I still have it somewhere, but I, I really like, it was like a, it was like an essay. Like I, I said all that to him. Like, if I don't try this, I'm going to live with regret. I don't want to be a guy who ever has that. Um, so, uh, please, if you would show me how to take a bump in the ring, cause I'd really love to learn, but yeah, it was, uh, that was exactly my thought process. Since you, uh, come from Elon, you know, we both know Taylor Durham, you know, yeah. what about guys like that? Your broadcasting friends, when they think you, you're going to wear a headset and geek out forever and you tell them you're going to be a wrestler. What was that like? Man, um, I wish I could say there was like a conversation about, about that, like telling people that I was going to do that. There really wasn't. Um, I was so, I was so lucky that, you know, from September to like November of 2019, our non-conference schedule was, or didn't line up with the wrestling dates that I was going to broadcast. Um, so there was never really a conflict with that, which was crazy that it worked out that way. But like, if there ever was, that would obviously need to be a conversation. So I wasn't like going out of my way to not tell people, but I was just kind of doing it on the side and, and seeing if there was anything there and weighing my options there and, and, you know, learning everything that I could. And then of course, having all the obligations to, you know, my other job, uh, so to speak with, um, the basketball broadcasting. Um, yeah, but it, it's kind of been the same reaction <laughs> that you had where it's like all my, the connections that I had, the friends that I made with in broadcasting, as soon as they see one thing of me, you know, flying around in a ring, they're like, what? Oh my gosh. I didn't even know this was you. When did this start? And it's, yeah. So there wasn't really like a conversation, but, um, it just sort of happened where, you know, this thing took off right as, uh, the broadcasting career was was kind of ending. You can you understand the uh, shock people have. Like I see you with a tie and a headset, and then side by side you with the speedo <laughs> and a shaved chest. You know it's <laughs> it's a shock to the system. Yeah, yeah, I imagine so. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how long does it take to learn? Uh, is it called a routine? You know, with the the choreography of, of these. Uh, matches. Mm -hmm. you know, what's the process involved in putting that together with your opponent? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, you know, there's a whole, there's a, there's a lot of basics that you have to learn first in, in pro wrestling. You have to learn how to, how to fall safely, which is called taking a bump. So, you know, when you get hit and the guy slams on his back in the ring, like there's technique to that. And, and everybody has to learn that before you can even start to have matches. But, um, when you're going through a match with your opponent or, or as we say, calling a match with your opponent, it depends. Um, you know, if you're, if you're friends with the person and you guys know what each other want to do, what each other wants to do, um, it can be pretty quick. It can be relatively easy. There's other times where you have to put together a rather complex match, um, where it does take some time and you have to rehearse it a little bit. Um, but it's 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 such a tough question to answer because it definitely varies. But um, yeah, there's definitely you know a lot of planning that goes into it, um, and obviously safety is paramount um, in any you know athletic um, performance. Um, but particularly in pro wrestling, that's the number one priority. So uh, you have to be safe, and you have to take as much time as you need in order to feel comfortable doing um, whatever you're planning on doing in the ring. What about taking a bump? You know, how long is that to master? Uh, again, it, it varies so much. Like, um, I was, I'm pretty lucky cause I, I pick up on, on things quick, especially physically. Um, but the first bump I took in, you know, however many years ago that was, it was a shock to the system. Cause it's not, you know, everybody thinks that the, the wrestling ring is like a trampoline or it's like a mattress or what have you it's not it's it's metal it's plywood it's an amateur wrestling mat and then the canvas you know it's it's not um very fun to hit very hard 
Um, but you know, when you get the technique down and you distribute your weight evenly, when you fall back, it's, it's not too bad. Um, but a lot of people are shocked the first time they take a bump. A lot of people can't really get it right. Um, I was fortunate enough to pick it up pretty quick and, and, uh, you know, be able to, to kind of, um, wrap my mind around the basics of, of a wrestling match, um, pretty quickly. So, well, some guys have to get hurt though, right? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's injuries all the time. There's kind of a joke, like, uh, among wrestlers, like everybody's hurt, you know, but it, it doesn't, we all, we all play through, you know, being hurt, so to speak. Um, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not very, uh, it's not a very comfortable, um, activity to, uh, to partake in for sure. Um, there's always going to be injuries. You're always going to be hurt. You're always going to be sore, but, uh, you know, it's that, it's that, it's the drug of the performance that keeps everybody going for sure. You mentioned the drug of the performance. The crowd's yeah. got to play a huge role in that, right? To feed off of that energy with them screaming. Yeah. When I was first getting into wrestling, I listened to, you know, every interview I could find from wrestlers that I look up to and, and want to emulate. And that's what they all say. They all say, you know, once you get in front of that crowd, there's nothing like it. Everything that's, that's stressing you out in life, all the pain that you're feeling physically, it all goes away when you see that crowd. And like, I never really got it until I, you know, went out in front of a crowd and started performing and was able to to entertain them and captivate them and have them feed off of what I was doing and, and vice versa. Um, yeah, it, there's really, really nothing like it. I think you can describe it as well as anyone when you're calling a game and there's a big crowd there, you know, the energy does help you project it, but you're also describing what other people are doing. Yes. And so you are the guy doing it, responding mm -hmm. to that crowd. Yeah, it's... It, there are definitely a lot of similarities to broadcasting in a, in a environment like that and, you know, um, wrestling in it, but it, it's so funny. Like that's the performance aspect to it. If you can tell a captivating story with your body in the ring so much so that the crowd is making noise and reacting to what you want them to react to and how you want them to react, it's, it's, there's absolutely nothing like it. Um, it's a pretty, like, you feel pretty powerful in that moment and, and, uh, you know, nothing can hurt you almost. You feel invincible there. So who came up with the nickname wonder boy? I did. Um, we were, gosh, my three of my, uh, wrestling buddies and I, um, uh, West, uh, Jordan and Christian, we were all going to, um, a, an event in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. And we were just talking through ideas. We were just thinking about wrestling in general. Um, and somehow the uh, topic of uh, MMA came up. I'm a huge MMA fan. I know a few uh, big MMA fans in, in the wrestling uh, business. And um, I'm a big uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson fan. Um, so it was like, what if I went by that? What if I did Wonderboy? What if I did Wonderboy Brian Mars? And everybody loved it. Um, and so the next event I was, I was booked on, it was in... Um, Jeez, Chucky, Tennessee, like a few weeks after that. And the ring announcer came up to me and said, what would you, what would you like your name to be? And I said, wonder boy, Brian Morris. And he was like, awesome. And I just, I just went with it. Um, yeah. So credit to Steven Thompson and being a great uh, martial artist that he is. I, I, I probably owe him something, some royalties down the road. Is wonder boy, good guy, bad guy. Is there That's anything the thing. to it, find? It, I feel like it can be whatever I want it to be, which is uh, which is a which is a big selling point on it for me. Um, right now, I'm a pretty bad guy on on camera, um, and uh, you know the the Wonder Boy aspect of it. Me calling myself that it's you know it's pompous, it's it's cocky, it's you know whatever I want it to be. But you know in the other in another sense, you know it could be you know oh I'm the young. Um, prospect i'm the most talented youngest guy coming up through the ranks of independent wrestling and that could maybe be a, that could be a good guy on camera one day and that could be you know a real cocky pompous guy the next day which i'm i'm playing the role of now is wonder boy dirty then in the ring oh yeah yeah he'll do whatever it takes to win and whatever it takes to make the crowd unhappy too so 
Yeah. So when the referee turns his back, even for an instant, you're getting away with a little extra shot there. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm getting away with everything too. Um, Slime bag. I'm, yes. I'm I'm uh a member of a, of a team right now called World Renowned. With uh, it's led by John Alba, who's a pretty well known um, podcast host on a uh, um, a wrestling podcast host. He does a podcast with Matt Hardy. For those wrestling fans out there, you should go listen to it. It's pretty fantastic. Um, my partners uh, in the ring, uh, Nick Batty and Christian Rocco, um, we make up this this trio, and uh, and we will do whatever it takes to win. Um, we will, you know, talk all the trash. We'll try to back it up in the ring. Doesn't always work that way, but for sure, yeah, we we go behind the refs back uh, more than our fair share of times. Your most recent uh, Twitter post has a great move, right, with the three of you. Is yes. that the move you're talking about? Um, it's it was one of them. Um, we so that was that was an incredible show. That was the biggest crowd I've ever performed at or performed in front of. Um, at the 2300 arena in Philadelphia. And for those, uh, EC or for those wrestling fans, it's the old ECW arena um, that they ran in, in the late 90s and early 2000s. So that was a big deal for us. Um, you know, not only the group that I'm a part of, but the entire, you know, Monster Factory professional wrestling roster and school uh, to run a show that big. Um, I believe the, the move you're referencing is the triple suplex we were on the wrong end of. Um, Yes, that that hurt pretty bad, but uh, but the crowd was very into it, and at the end of the day, that's that's all that matters. So, you are pretty theatrical out there. You know, a lot of facial gestures, <laughs> moving your body, and yeah. really playing to the crowd. That, that's fun. Oh my god, it's 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 a blast, and that takes like a while to learn how to be um, bigger than you are and and perform for the entire crowd you have to be so big and it has to register not only with the people in the front row but the people in the back row too um so yeah i try to be and it's 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 gotten rather easy for me which is which is i think a, a good sign and um the people seem to seem to react to it especially when i'm the wrong when i'm at the wrong end of something so uh yeah it's it's a great time doing all well that. a stage actor like someone that's overacting it's obvious hey you need to dial it down a little bit mm. but with what you do it's like, hey give me more give me more yes. be, be bigger be more over the top yes like it was it was pretty difficult for me to kind of to have that click in my head because i'm like i'm a rather reserved guy um <clears throat> i'm i'm i guess you i guess i would call myself an introvert maybe i don't know um but you know, in broadcasting it was the same way you know you had to create that energy especially if it if it wasn't there whether it was in front of you know a, an arena with not a lot of people in it or whether it was like a blowout game where there was no real excitement like in the game in terms of you know the the result being in question or something like that you always had to manufacture that energy and it's you know the same philosophy in in wrestling sometimes the crowd's not into it sometimes you go out there and they just witnessed a great match right before you and you come out there and they're they're dead and they're they need something to to feed off of. So you have to give them that and you have to be big and you have to perform, you know, even more so than than maybe you you usually would. So um yeah, when that clicked for me, I, I definitely noticed that uh I was getting a lot more reaction, a lot more energy from the people, and every performer in the ring feeds off that. I just thought about that. I've had dates that have been going nowhere. I needed to bring some extra energy <laughs> to put it exactly. over the top. <laughs> there you go. Things are kind that's of flat a, that's a good out. way to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually bringing back some painful memories, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate you nonetheless. Hey, so you mentioned uh, traveling around. I'm going to talk to my therapist in a couple hours after that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you mentioned uh, traveling around. Is it kind of like a, a, a nightclub singer or a comic where you're going from city to city and bouncing around all over the place from gig it's to so gig. interesting yeah it's it's so my level not so much um because you know i'm still trying to um i'm still trying to, to quote unquote get booked every weekend right now for wrestling um but when i imagine and i have some friends who are on tv weekly and and you know on wwe and AEW television and things like that when they describe it and when people that i've you know looked up to in the industry describe it it's a lot like that it's i'm also a big fan of comedy i'm a big fan of like these 
comedians who do podcasts, all sorts of things like that. And when they describe being on the road, it's, it's, it's pretty close to what, you know, a wrestler experiences at that level. Um, yeah, being in a, a new city every night performing, you know, not necessarily the same act, but a similar act in front of people and trying to get that reaction. And, and, um, yeah, the, the travel aspect is, is, was certainly very appealing to me to see, you know, all sorts of things all over the country, hopefully internationally as well. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, I imagine the, the similarities are, are, uh, are pretty close. How much recovery time would you need between gigs so you can go out and do it again? Man, that's again, it, it depends. I try to, um, obviously first and foremost, I try to be safe in the ring whenever I'm, whenever I'm in the ring. Um, but it's also about longevity. There's so many professional wrestlers who, you know, never make it to the WWE, which is the pinnacle of, of this industry. And, you know, unfortunately suffer from injuries that keep them from ever, you know, progressing in their career or, or, um, keep them from wrestling at all, you know, that have to retire. Um, so, you know, you, you have to keep your body in, in good shape. You have to be careful with what you do in the ring and you have to find the balance between, you know, doing everything you can in the ring to entertain the audience, but also being safe and not taking as many bumps, so to speak, and not putting your body through a lot, but still getting that reaction. And that's something that is very, very difficult to master. Um, if you do, you're obviously able to take a lot more bookings and hopefully get paid a lot more and wrestle more often. Um, so I think everybody's trying to find, everybody tries to find that balance, um, to keep your body in good shape and to extend your career as much as possible. But you couldn't do that three or four days a week. Could you? That's what the guys on TV do. You know, they're, they're wrestling, they're wrestling, um, Sunday night. If it's like a, it's like a pay-per-view event, they're wrestling the next night. Um, now since, you know, one of their TV shows isn't taped anymore, they're waiting till Thursday or Friday to wrestle again. And then they have, uh, live events throughout the country, which is, you know, non-televised shows just for the audience in attendance. And they tour the country doing that. They wrestle three, four, five times a week. Um, so yeah, that's what you have to do, especially if, if you get to that level. What's your, uh, own personal training like then? Man, it varies. Um, the Monster Factory does such a great job of of making sure that all the wrestlers and all the people in that system or in that school, um, they're prepared for whatever, whether it's, you know, mastering the, the technique in the ring to, um, you know, just staying in shape outside of the ring, making sure that you're still athletic and you still have the cardio to do what we do because it's 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 rather taxing. Um, so the school, the monster factory, it definitely helps. It, it's helped me tremendously with that staying in shape and, and making sure I'm prepared for the type of things that I'm doing in the ring. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's cardiovascular training, it's weight training. It's, you know, it's, it's a combination of everything and, and everybody kind of has their own regimen that they follow. Um, depending on how they want to look or how they want to perform in the ring. So um, it takes a lot of work to stay in shape for that, for sure. So it's not the typical football, squat, clean, bench stuff. It's more uh, athletic interval training, kettlebells. What do you do? For me, that's that's kind of what I focus on. Um, but there are there are definitely guys who, who are more, um, you know, as you described, like I guess the, the, the football regimen or, you know, the athletic regimen of – you know, heavy squats, heavy cleans, whatever the case may be. Um, they're absolutely guys that, that do that. And, and, uh, and if it works for them, that's great. Um, my training right now is, is a lot of body weight exercises, a lot of high intensity interval training, um, and a lot of, um, you know, functional strength to, uh, avoid injury and, or try to avoid injury and, uh, and still, you know, aesthetically, um, look the part too. Yeah. You gotta look jacked as well. So you have to have that balance, right? Yeah. What about, uh, yoga? You know, I, I really tried to get into it, um, senior year of college. Um, and it's so funny cause there's a, there's a great program. It's called uh, DDP yoga and DDP diamond Dallas page was a great 
wrestler in WCW back in the late nineties. And he's kind of blown up in that industry. Um, and I really tried to get into it and I never could. And I really want to, cause like, I'm not a very flexible guy as it is. Um, and I really want to be more flexible, not only just like to be more flexible, but because I think it'll help my performance and my athleticism and everything like that. I really want to get into it, but I, I just haven't done it yet. Are you familiar with this dude named, uh, the knees over toes guy? No, Ben Patrick. Not. And it's a lot of athletic type movements to get your body to function like it did when you were a kid. So, you know, full ass to grass squats, knee mm -hmm. over toe with lunges, really flexible, but strong and powerful and athletic in these different positions. Totally sold on his stuff. It's fantastic. Okay. Send you some links. Yeah, I'd love that. That'd be great. Hey, so what's the next uh, level for you that you need to climb from where you're at right now? I know what the ultimate is, but how does it work from like a, a like baseball, a single A, double A, triple A? You know, how do you climb from where you are now to ultimately where you want to be? Yeah, I keep feeling like I answer the every question with the same answer. It's it varies with everybody. I mean, there's people who um, you know, were just wrestling where I wrestle at the Monster Factory who end up getting signed because they go to a tryout and uh, WWE has tryouts periodically throughout the year. They'll bring people down that that um either our coach sends or or that they apply for and they get the they get that tryout spot and uh you know if they perform well and the wwe likes them they'll sign them um and it's happened with two students that i know relatively recently um some people are lucky enough to have that path to you know that level other people are you know work their way through the independent wrestling scene and and um you know, get uh, a chance on TV every once in a while or, or uh, are, you know, seen by a person on a show that has, um, I guess, influence at a major company or influence or friends with somebody at a major company. It's all networking. It's all like word of mouth for the most part. It's, it's a lot of it's on social media. So everybody takes different paths to that, to that, uh, to that, pinnacle of the business if you ever get there um it takes some people a year it takes some people 20 years to finally get their chance but um i'm just doing whatever i can to get seen by as many people as possible to hopefully get a chance on on tv sooner rather than later and uh if that tryout ever comes where you know i'm a, i'm able to go down there and and perform to the best of my abilities i will absolutely uh take that opportunity and hopefully it, it works out I want to get on one more thing from your mom before we go. This is some advice and some thoughts on the business. He's taken this time to not only learn about the business, which is very important, and learn about the performance aspect and learn, you know, push his own boundaries and see what he's capable of. Um, but also understand that when you have a plan, you know, the path from A to B is not always a straight line. And that's, that's something that I've always... Um, I've always said to him, he'll probably say, I've said it so many times that he's sick of me saying it, but I think it's helping him to not only really fulfill a, a really lifelong passion, but also to help map out, you know, what his next steps are personally and professionally. That, I saw your, your body language right there when she said, he's probably sick of hearing it, you nod. <laughs> but you also, I could see the smile too, like, this is really good advice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my mom's the best with, with, you know, everything, but particularly, you know, business advice and advice like that, just life advice in general. She's a hundred percent right. And it, it applies not only to, you know, life itself, but like just the wrestling business too. Like, um, when I st first started going to wrestling school, like I had to learn how to, uh, you know, be a referee and how to break down a ring and, and load a ring into a truck and travel. And then, take it out and load it up and set it up like and in the moment you're like why this doesn't apply to wrestling this has nothing to do with what's on camera but it does like you have to learn how to do that that's kind of the path of the business like if you're a student you have to learn how to be on ring crew you have to learn how to ref you have to do all these other things and then when you get the chance to be a wrestler you'll have all this knowledge you'll have all this appreciation for the business and the performance and everything like that so it's not a straight path to where you want to go um uh, in wrestling, that's true. In life, that's true. Um, unfortunately, like 
very few independent wrestlers can, you know, support themselves just on wrestling. So it's, it's so important to supplement that with another form of income. And sometimes when you're in that, you know, grind of applying for jobs or doing another job outside of wrestling, all you're thinking about is what I'm going to do that night wrestling. And, uh, it's so important to, to be able to, you know, put yourself in that situation first and, um, focus on every other thing that you have to focus on in order to make wrestling possible. So it's great advice. And she'll keep saying that and I'll keep listening to it. And, uh, as, as funny as my reaction might've been, no, it's a hundred percent true. And it's probably some of the best advice I've gotten. Brian, what does it mean to you to have someone like that? And I get emotional talking about people like that because you have to have them, you know, if you're going to make it in life. It's, I can't even describe it. I mean, it, I'm so lucky to have such a supportive group of people around me, um, particularly my immediate family um, and, you know, my mom in particular. Um, there's so many stories that I hear from colleagues of mine who have a job and have a promising career path and like th not throw it away, but put it to the side to pursue wrestling. And the stories usually end with, yeah, my, you know, my, my family hated it. They said, you're an idiot. They said, you're throwing all this away. They said, you know, you're, you're not going to make any money, blah, blah, blah. All the things that go along with that. And I never experienced that. When I first started trying to be a pro wrestler, my mom, I, obviously, as, as you know, she knows that I had a passion for it and she knows that I've loved it for a long time. So when I tried it, it was nothing but a hundred percent support. And, um, I'm so lucky to have that. And it's not just her, it's my entire family, my cousins in particular. Like, um, I remember I was home for a Christmas one, one year, 2019. And uh, as you know, Dave, like when, when you're doing a, a season worth of basketball games, those holiday breaks, especially when you're in school, aren't really holiday breaks. There are a few days, there are a weekend at most, and then you're right back on the road. Um, so I had to leave, uh, I think it was December 28th to go back to school as opposed to having, you know, the full three weeks or two weeks off, whatever we had at, at Elon. And, uh, my cousins were like, why do you have to go back? Why aren't you spending New Year's with us? And me, you know, um, saying, I will, I have my first wrestling match on December 28th and kind of like tensing up for what their reaction is going to be. And it was nothing but, oh my God, that's so cool. That's so great. When did you start this? It was nothing but support. And, and a lot of the same people that I, it was, it's so funny that, that we bring that up because, um, that was three years ago and almost everybody that was at that, um, that party that I was, that I was attending where I told everybody that I had my first match, almost everybody was there last Thursday to watch me perform on the biggest show. So. Um, it was pretty special. I'm so lucky to have everybody around me. Your mom also, I guess, is in charge of your tanning, right? Because <laughs> you're, you're naturally kind of pale. So she mentioned that you're, oh, the, my goodness. you're the guy that gets yes. the bronze from her, right? Yes. She plays a big part in that for sure. Yes. Again, it's, it's, it's a cosmetic business, Dave. You have to be, you have to look your best for the camera. And, uh, as you can see, yeah, my skin tone is not very dark, um, naturally so you have to do something about that sometimes yeah how often do you have to wax your chest oh i i shave yeah it's i don't really grow like there's i don't really have much hair growth like here so yeah it's it's uh i don't really know how often i every week for sure but yeah okay yeah now you're going places young man it's uh like i said <laughs> when I, I i saw some of the social media stuff i, I gotta reach out to this dude because i remember him as mr clean cut and offering some great basketball analysis uh breaking it down uh knowing every statistic knowing the scouting report and this guy is now uh you know, throwing people across the ring so it's yeah uh, pretty cool and i have so much respect for uh, chasing your dream you know it means a lot Thank you so much. It was, it's great to reconnect with you. It was, it's awesome. I've, you know, followed what you're doing since uh, we met in, yeah, Stockton, California. What, what, a, what a time it's been since then, for sure. Hey, give everybody your uh, social media information so they can follow what Wonder Boy's doing. Um, at Brian G. Morris, B-R-I-A-N-G-M-O-R-R-I-S. That's my handle on 
everything, I think. So yeah, easy to follow. You, you have TikTok too? I do not have a TikTok. I should get on TikTok, right? That's the next thing, man. I mean, I know that <laughs> folks are losing some of their Instagram engagement because of all the TikTok. So that's got to be the next thing for you. Okay. I'll be sure Especially to get on. Especially with all the stuff you do in the ring. It, it's great video. Do you have a TikTok? I just started. I had some- You just started it? 16-year-old you know, tell me I needed to do it. And okay. um, I know a lot of my folks um, you know, in radio broadcasting business, um, that's the next thing that we've got to master. You and I got to master that you know, to take our, our promotion game to the next level. Yeah. All right. I'll get on that. Wonder Boy, Brian Morris. I enjoyed the visit, young man. I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to reconnect.